Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so remember uh, what we saw back in chapter chapter five was that if we have um, two random variables or even more, uh, if we want their joint distribution and the random variables are independent, then we can just take the product of their of their marginal distributions. So the joint distribution of a random sample is just the product of the individual distributions. And uh, so this leads us to the idea of a likelihood function. Um, in general, our, our uh, random variables, our random sample x1 to xn can depend on parameters. Um, usually it's just one or two, but it could in theory be a lot more. Um, and so after we observe, after we observe data, or you could think uh, eventually we will be observing data, so once we have that, um, this, joint, this joint distribution turns into a function of the parameters. So remember, I don't know what the parameters are, but if I collect data, I can plug that in, and then I'll get uh, the same thing, but I can think about it as a function of my parameters. And that's, so when I regard this joint distribution as a function of my parameters, um, then, it's, then it's called the, something called the likelihood function. And, uh, and the main idea with, with maximum likelihood is that we want to find um, values of the parameters uh, in terms of our data that, that maximize this thing. So Stacy gave you a little bit of an intuitive, uh, there was a, a picture of this that we, we actually plotted the likelihood function and could, could see where it was maximized. Um, and uh, so when, um, so yeah, so, so the maximum, maximum likelihood estimates of each of my parameters are those values that, that maximize this, this likelihood function. Okay, so uh, just remember some things about, some calculus things to, to, to uh, bring your attention to again. Just remember that if I want to find the maximum of a function, I need to um, take its derivative and set that equal to zero. Um, that only gives me a, a sort of a critical value of that function, so to make sure that that's a maximum, I need to go on and take the second derivative um, and so in general, if I take the second derivative and evaluate that at the point where the first derivative equals zero, if that's less than zero, then I have, then I have a maximum. So if it's greater than zero, I have a minimum. If it's equal to zero, I have a um, saddle point or something like that, if that's what it's called. Um, so I want to make sure that the second derivative evaluated at that, at that critical value is, is less than zero to make sure that I have a maximum. Okay. Uh, so then, a very helpful a very helpful fact for actually for actually doing this in practice is uh, is this here. So uh, so the same value of the parameters that that maximize the likelihood function will maximize the the natural log of the likelihood. So natural log is a monotone function, so the it uh, preserves the um, maximum values there. So if I want to find a, a maximum likelihood estimate, I can either find a maximum of the likelihood. Or as will, will usually be a much easier job for you is I can find the maximum of the of the natural log of the likelihood. Um, so these things will give you the same answer, um, but it's often much more easy to to find a maximum of the natural log of the likelihood rather than rather than the likelihood by itself. Okay, one more one more calculus fact to recall. I'm not sure we're. I think we've shuffled around some examples. I'm not sure we actually use that, but remember what the chain rule is, you might, you might need to use that at some point. So that's just another, another calculus fact to make sure it's still floating around there in your brain. Okay, so uh, with Stacey on Monday, you guys did a number of uh, examples, started out simple and, and got slightly more complex at the end. Want to do a few more examples of how to actually find maximum likelihood estimates. And then... Um, and then introduce some new notation and do another example or two. Okay, so, so let's suppose now that we have a random sample, x1 up to xn, from a normal distribution. And um, here we're saying that the, the mean, we don't know what that is, but the, the, the variance of this thing, we, d we do know what that is. So the variance is known to be 1. Okay, so therefore the, the uh, distribution of each one of my x's, each of the xi have a distribution that looks like this. So that's just the normal, the normal PDF that we've seen a few times now with uh, sigma squared equals 1 plugged in. So, so this is sigma squared is plugged in there. Okay, so find the, to, if I want to find the maximum likelihood estimate of mu, 
Um, let's let's go ahead and see about how to do this. So, so the first step is always to write out write out what the what the joint likelihood is. So step one here is write out the the joint likelihood. for your random sample here. So uh, the joint distribution here, sorry, let me say joint distribution. So the joint distribution of, of all my x's here, uh, which depends on mu, is going to be simply the product. So remember that large pi symbol is, is the product. Um, of the individual densities here, okay, and then I uh, can just write that in with what I have there. It's a product of uh, one over the square root of two pi um, times the exponent. filling in there what the the individual densities are okay and so I can I can simplify this thing a little bit right um, so the 1 over 2 pi does not depend on the subscript so I can bring that outside and uh, that'll be multiplied together n times so 1 over the square root of 2 pi comes outside, raised to the nth power. And then I have the product of a bunch of exponent, exponential terms. Um, so what can I do with that? Well, if you remember, um, for example, if I have e to the a times e to the b, how can I, how can I simplify that thing? If I have exponent of something uh, of e to the eighth power times e to the b, b to the power. Exactly right. Yes. So, if multiplying exponents, I can add them as long as my, as long as your base stays the same. Okay. So that's I can I can use that here to, to make this a little easier on myself. So, product of the exponents is the exponents of a sum here. And I can, take the one half outside. This is sum from one to n. Xi minus mu. Squared. Okay, everyone okay with the exp meaning exponential? So, exp of equals e to the y. <clears throat> so I'm using the notation there. Okay, so now I have my my uh, my joint distribution of these things um, in a slightly more easy to work with form. Okay, so so next I need to um, next, I need to take the derivative of this thing with respect to with respect to the parameter mu. So, will it be? Well, okay. Let's let's write that out. So next, I want to uh, take derivatives with respect to mu. Um, so that's the derivative with respect to mu of the joint distribution okay so that's the derivative with respect to mu of 1 over 2 pi square root of 2 pi to the nth times the exponent the sum Okay, and does anybody want to take that derivative? Uh, it would, would be possible, but it would be very messy. <laughs> so instead, let's let's instead take the uh, try taking the the derivative of the natural log of of my of my li likelihood here. So instead, 
I'll take the derivative with respect to mu of the natural log of my of my likelihood here. So x1 to xn. So the derivative with respect to mu of. Okay, so I think you guys talked about that was in here. Well, it's a good time maybe to review some properties of, of the natural log. So um, natural log of a product is, is what? So if I have the natural log of A times B, um, how, do I, how can I simplify that? Addition. Addition, right, yes. So natural log of A plus the natural log of B. That's going to be the, the biggest one to use. Um, so this is um, natural log, my likelihood is uh, the natural log of 1 over square root of 2 pi uh, to the nth power um, plus the natural log of the exponent of negative 1 half times the sum See over there. <clears throat> okay, and of course you can also, um, for that first term, you can take um, exponents down out in front of a natural log. Um, let's jump over to slide in a minute here. Okay, uh, so this is equal to. I need to take the derivative with respect to mu of, I can bring the n out front and actually make it a negative n. Um, the natural log and the exponent cancel, so I'm left with a negative 1 half times the sum of uh, xi minus mu squared. Okay, so now I'm ready to finally take some derivatives here. Uh, the, the first thing goes away, so this is the same as the derivative with respect to mu of negative one half yeah uh, and again, derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives, right so this is. Take the derivative inside the sum. <clears throat> Still haven't actually taken any derivatives yet. Uh, and so I can take the derivative of that inside term is, uh, is 2 times uh, xi minus mu times negative 1 there. <clears throat> Again, the negative 1 because mu is negative inside that. I guess that is using the chain rule there. <clears throat> so my 2's cancel, my negatives cancel there, and I end up with um, the sum of the xi's. minus n times mu. <clears throat> Everybody staying with me? Okay. Okay, so now I have my derivative, and uh, now I need to, to figure out where this thing is, uh, has a maximum. I need to set this equal to 0. So I need to set uh, the sum of the xi's minus n times mu equal to 0. And that means that my, my possible estimate here is 
uh, 1 over n times the sum of the xi's, which is the which is the mean. Lo and behold. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so that tells me that the, the sample mean will give me a place where the likelihood is, uh, the derivative of the likelihood equals, equals zero. So again, I need to make sure that, again, remember the derivative equaling zero does not necessarily guarantee that I have a maximum. So to make sure I have a maximum, I need to take the second derivative and make sure that's less than zero. Okay, so I wanna check, check that I have a max. <clears throat> and that involves taking the second derivative. So take second derivatives here of the natural log of the joint distribution of the like, log of the likelihood, which is just need to take the derivative now of what we just found above there, sum of the xi's minus n times mu. So that's the first derivative, just need to take the derivative one more time. And that equals just plain old negative, negative n. Okay, so is that is that less than zero? Well, yes, of course it is, because n has to be a positive number. <clears throat> Okay, so I do, I do indeed have a maximum value here, and what that tells me is that uh, my maximum likelihood estimate is what we just found is, is up there. So, so therefore, the MLE uh, is mu hat equals, equals x bar. It's going to blow your minds, isn't it? That's the maximum likelihood estimate. <laughs> Should be just what you expect. <clears throat> Questions, comments? Is that, is that okay, what we're doing here? Yeah. For certain distributions, can we just assume that the uh, MLE of mu uh, is just equal to the mean? So for certain, for, for a, a general distribution, can you just assume that the, the MLE for the mean is, is x bar? Um, no, <laughs> so it doesn't. It doesn't always quite work out this way. And and also remember that um, oftentimes the parameter you're trying to find the maximum likelihood estimate for is not necessarily the mean, right? So in the in the gamma distribution, for example, uh, the mean is alpha times beta. So um, you can't directly just jump to that step. Um, doesn't quite work out that way. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question. Other questions you guys can think of? Is this fine? No big deal? Feeling okay? All right. Okay, so uh, unfortunately we can't always use calculus to find uh, maximum likelihood estimates. Um, and this shows, up, this shows up on your homework. Um, so to kind of uh, figure out a way to work around this issue, um, we can introduce some new terminology here, some new notation. Um, and this is the idea of an indicator function. So uh, if A is some interval on the, on the real line, the indicator function uh, is defined as follows. So for that set A, um, the indicator function I sub A of X equals one if X falls within A and it equals zero otherwise. Um, so actually, kind of the way that I, I think this is how your book, book does things. Um, how I sort of prefer to do this is write it out, the indicator that, that X is in A. I think that is a little easier to write down and makes makes a little more intuitive sense. So either either way you want to write that down is fine. Um, point is we're just letting this thing be a zero or a one. Uh, it's one when the when the value of x is in that set and it's zero when it's outside that set. So some sort of concrete examples here: um, indicator function uh, over the interval uh, zero to one. Four, which is the same as uh, the indicator that um, 
well, we'll leave it as the book's notation for now. The indicator that uh, 4 is between 0 and 1, well, that's a 0. 4 is not between, four is not between 0 and 1. Uh, similarly, the indicator is set 0 to 1 of 0 0.2. Is one since uh, point two is in that is in that set, so so you get the idea. The the um, indicator is just a way of 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 giving a one or zero if that if that value is in that set or not, um, and you might see me write it in some different ways up there. Okay, and th these things these things will be helpful, especially when the uh, especially these will help helpful to use when when the Distribution of my random sample depends on so the range of that of that distribution depends on the parameter. Um, so uh, here is here's an example, and I am just now realizing I forgot to change this. So we're going to uh, pretend that lambda in your in your your notes are correct. I, I forgot to make the change on the slide here. Um, so here here we have that the that the range of my random sample depends on the parameter. So if I have a random sample here from this, this shifted exponential distribution, we saw this, we saw this earlier. Um, there's how we've sort of classically written it out that uh, f of x given, given theta is equal to something that looks like an exponential, but it's just shifted by, by this value theta. So if I want to find the maximum likelihood estimate of theta, um, we can kind of do so in the usual way. Uh, so Again, let's make a note here. We can write this this uh, PDF here. We can write f of x i given theta. Well, that's the the density e to the negative x i minus theta. Um, but then instead of defining it in that uh, in the way we've done it up there, I can I can multiply this times an indicator function, of making sure that the x i is bigger than or equal to theta. So that's sort of a more concise way to write out what the um, what the PDF of a of one one sample is here. Okay, so then again, my first step is to write out the the joint distribution. Um, So the, the distribution of my random sample, again, is just the product of the individual uh, densities. So that's uh, e to the negative xi minus theta times the indicator that xi is bigger than or equal to theta. Okay, so nothing, nothing new there, um, and then we can again we can try to we can simplify this thing. So again, the I have a product of a bunch of exponential terms, uh, so that'll be the exponent of I'll turn into a sum. This is the negative sum from i equals one to n of x i minus theta. But then I still have this product over here of indicator functions. So indicator that. Um, xi is bigger than or equal to theta. Okay, so just transform, uh, trans, um, simplify the exponential term, but I still have that that product over there. Okay, so this is uh, again this is the indicator that the first one is bigger than or equal to th to theta times the indicator that the second one bigger than theta all the way up to um, the care that the last one is bigger than theta. Okay, so I, I have a product of things here, right? Each of which is, is one or zero. Um, so my argument to you here is that this, this here equals, equals one um, if and only if. Um, the 
smallest xi is bigger than theta, right? So if I, if I put my x1, x2, xn, all the way up to xn in order, um, as long as the smallest one is bigger than theta, that whole thing will be equal to 1. So this is um, equal to 1 if and only if the minimum of the xi's is bigger than or equal to theta. <clears throat> So that's something more you have to think about intuitively. Does that make sense? So, so all of those functions, uh, the product of all those indicator functions will be equal to 1 if and only if they're all equal to 1, right? So they're all e 1 or 0. So for that to be equal to 1, they all have to be 1, which means all the x's have to be bigger than theta. And so that's true um, as long as my smallest x is bigger than theta. Is that OK with everybody? Um, so then I can write this as the exponent of negative times the indicator that <clears throat> the minimum of the xi's is bigger than or equal to theta. Okay, so the problem, the problem here, uh, when, when we said on the previous slide, unfortunately we can't always use calculus here, um, is how do you take the derivative, oh yeah. Could you rewrite the exponential function on the left as like, e to the uh, negative x1 plus dot dot dot? Would it, would, it be, would it make sense to think of it like that, or should you use a sigma notation? So it's more straightforward. Oh, oh, so if you, instead of using the summation notation, if you just did x1 plus x2, that, that's fine too. So if you'd rather write, if you'd rather write the sum of the xi's or whatever as uh, x1 plus x2 plus, that's, that's fine too, yeah. Is, is that what you were asking? Yeah, what would, what would that look like if you wrote it down? Uh, for, for my... Um, joint distribution down here? Is that what you mean? Or? No, 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 just for the exponential half. The part to the left, what would it look like? Um, this part over here? Yeah. Um, well, so, so since I don't have a squared term in my, in my summation there, um, the theta can come outside that summation. Oh, okay. So this would be, um, just this part here would be the exponent of um, the negatives to come outside, so I have, and I have n of those thetas, and subtracting off, say, x1 plus x2 plus something like that. So, so take the log first. Well, yeah, so, so, so that's, that's where we're going next, okay. yeah. So, so um, before, we, before we think about taking the log of this, or the natural log of this, um, the problem here is that even if I take the natural log, I can't, I can't take a derivative of an indicator function. It's just a 0 or a 1, um, and I, I, I can't take the derivative of that. It's a discontinuous function, right? Um, so calculus is not going to work in this, in this case to, to find our maximum likelihood estimate. So what do we do, what do, we do instead? Uh, well, instead we can, make, we can make a graph. So we can uh, do a visual proof here. So my, my likelihood... Remember here is the the likelihood. This is the exponent exponent of uh, n times theta minus something, right? So minus the sum the xi's times the indicator that um, before we written it, wanted to make sure that my the smallest value was um, bigger than theta. That's equivalent to saying that theta is less than the minimum of the xi's. Okay? So if theta if theta is bigger than the minimum of the xi's, then my likelihood is zero, right? Because if that indicator function is zero, it zeroes everything else out. <clears throat> so I pretty much what I pretty much have here is an exponential function of theta that goes up and that that is defined until I get to some value um, 
the minimum of my xi's. Um, so let's say that this point here is the minimum of my xi's. And so I'll pretty much just have a exponential function that, well, maybe increase faster than this, but is increasing until I get to that minimum value. And then it comes down here and it's just zero for the rest of for the rest of the theta values. So the graph is maybe not to scale, but uh, the idea is that I have an exponential function, so we all know what that looks like. It just kind of goes off um, to infinity, but it's only defined until I get to some value, that minimum of the xi's, and then it's just zero from there on out. And this goes off towards zero on the other direction as well. Okay, so where is, what is, what is my maximum likelihood estimate here? What value of theta down there on the, on the x-axis gives me the maximum value of my likelihood? That's right. So, it's, yeah, the, the maximum of my likelihood is just, is, is right here. That's the maximum point of my likelihood. So, um, so the... MLE of theta is um, the minimum of my xi's. And we're done. So I don't have to do any calculus here. Uh, if, I can, if I can make a picture like this to kind of visualize what's going on, Again, the argument that is that my likelihood is, is, is increasing. It's an increasing function of theta until I get to some value, and then it's, and then it's zero. So the maximum is just that, that upper bound there. Um, and just make a note that uh, calculus doesn't work here. Um, because, the, because the maximum occurs at a point of discontinuity. So the likelihood function is not continuous there. So um, the max occurs. A point of discontinuity. Okay, so we're done there. That's uh, a little more straightforward. Questions, comments? Can you go back to like two slides for a second? Yeah, absolutely. There or <clears throat> so what happens here that made you use the indicator function? Yeah, good question. So what happened here that made made us use the indicator function? Um, this is just due to the fact that the range. So I used the indicator function because the range of my PDF uh, depends on theta. So my, my, uh, the PDF here is only defined for values of x that are bigger than theta. So like with the normal distribution, uh, x could be anything from positive to negative infinity, technically. Um, for the gamma distribution, it's always from 0 to infinity. Exponential is always 0 to infinity. A lot of these sort of standard cases have, um, have a range that, that doesn't depend on the parameters. Um, so here in this case, when the range does depend on the parameters, so like the uniform distribution, which is one of your homework problems, which I'll show you guys, uh, we'll talk about in just a second here. Um, those, those things, uh, you will want to be using indicator functions when the range depends on a parameter. <clears throat> we okay on the same page here? Okay. Yes, so, so yes, I, I wanted, to, oh, okay, to finish this out, um, and I don't think this is in your notes, but we'll pretend that uh, Lambda's not there, but just to remember that, uh, so suppose now that I, so again, what, what we've done on this previous page is before we've collected any information, this is saying assume I will have a random sample from this distribution, um, uh, and if n equals 10 and I have, I have 10 observations from this distribution, um, I can actually, again, remember, I can't actually write down what my maximum likelihood estimate here is. Um, 
So remember the, the maximum likelihood for estimate for theta is just the minimum of the xi's. So if you look at this sample here, it looks like um, 0 0.64 is the maximum likelihood estimate. So again, just remember, it's a very quick example to say, uh, if you actually have data to calculate these things, here's what your, here's what your estimate would be. Okay, um, I wanted to say, uh, so this kind of follows up this, this idea of an indicator function, give you guys a little bit of a, a heads up on your homework um, that's due on Friday. So number seven was asking you about a random sample from a uniform distribution on zero to theta. Um, so if I want to know what the maximum likelihood estimate of theta is, um, kind of go through our usual steps, right? I need to um, write out the likelihood, and then once I have that together, I can, I can either um, go the calculus route or go the picture route, <laughs> um, like the example we just did. Um, so what, what is the likelihood of, of, of theta? So let's write out, again, remember that the PDF for a single observation given theta is what? If I have a uniform distribution, what's the PDF of that thing? Yeah, so 1 over theta. But what else do I need to be true? So the, the xi has to, has to fall where? Yeah, so this has to be, so this is only, uh, this is only true when x falls between 0 and theta. So again, it's a way of just writing out in a single line what my, what my PDF is here. Again, before, maybe just make the note that before we wrote this thing as this, in this bracket, so it's 1 over theta if, um, and it's zero otherwise. So those are the same thing. Again, the, using the indicator function just lets you write that all out in one line. So we have the same, same notation there, or, or the, same, the same thing, just slightly different notation. OK, so then uh, the joint distribution of these things, um, is just the product of the individual PDFs, right? So I have a random sample, so this is 1 over theta times indicator okay and I can write this out again the theta doesn't depend on the subscript so I can pull that outside that's 1 over theta to the nth power and so I'll have, I'll still have this product of indicators Okay, and how can I how can I write? So now, how can I write the product of those indicators in a slightly simpler way? So this is uh, one over theta to the n times what? <clears throat> Say it again. Right, so I, now I need my, my biggest x value to be smaller than theta, right? Um, so I want the indicator that um, the maximum of the xi's is less than or equal to theta. And then just sort of for completeness, I need to multiply this times one other thing. What else do I need to be true? Absolutely, yeah. So I just need to make sure that my minimum is also bigger than zero. Okay, so writing my likelihood, at, writing out my joint distribution or the or the likelihood for theta out in this way. Um, is the is the first biggest step of, of finding a maximum likelihood estimate, and then from here again, if you if you have an indicator function, that's a good si signal that you're going to need to um, draw a picture because I can't remember I can't take a derivative of an indicator function, 
Um, so from here, think about um, drawing a picture of what that of what that likelihood looks like, and um, and that should tell you where the what the maximum likelihood is uh, estimate is, and then and then you're done. Okay, so that's that's a, a good hint there. So just in summary, to find this is this is not in your notes here. I just wanted to kind of summarize this thing here. So to find a maximum likelihood estimate, first step, right out the right out the likelihood. So and and you want to use indicator functions if the range of the x's depends on theta. Um, so once you have your likelihood, if, if that is the case, you might want to try graphing it, uh, if, if you can sort of conceptually think about how to do that. Um, otherwise, take derivatives, be the likelihood or the log, uh, natural log of the likelihood, set that thing equal to zero and, and solve for theta, and then just make sure that you have a um, maximum by taking second, second derivative, evaluating that at your, at your root, and making sure that's, that's less than zero. And the point is that, that that this step five is unnecessary if you've if you used the method in number two. So if you if you've graphed the likelihood to kind of see visually what the likelihood what the MLE is, you don't need to check that you have a maximum because you've already you've already done that. You've done that uh, algebraically instead of uh, using calculus. Okay. So just a few a few more comments about maximum likelihood estimates to finish things off here. Um, MLEs have this really this really interesting thing called the invariance property, uh, invariance principle, um, and that is just that they are invariant to functions. Um, so uh, formally here, if I have if I have a bunch of MLEs, then the MLE of any function of those things is the same function of of the parameters. Um, so for example. Um, if I have if I have a random sample of normal uh, mu sigma squared, uh, we won't we won't actually go about doing this, but the the MLE for sigma squared um, is is one over n times the sum uh, so it's almost the sample variance there. Um, so that's that's just given here. This is the MLE for the variance. Okay, so you can just take that as a fact. Um, but if I ask you to instead find the maximum likelihood estimate of the standard deviation, Well, we know the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance, right? So this is um, just going to be equal to the square root of sigma hat squared, which is this the square root of of, uh, of the of the sample uh, of the MLE for the variance. Okay, so you don't have to go through the whole song and dance again of, of uh, finding um, of finding exactly what the MLE of that standard deviation is. You can just use your knowledge of, of the MLE for the variance and take the square root. So that's that's a pretty pretty neat property. Um, and then just a few more sort of uh, notes in statistical nature here that um, the uh, so the maximum likelihood estimate is not always going to be unbiased. Um, but if you have a really large sample size, some asymptotic properties here are that um, if I have a really large sample size, the maximum likelihood will be estimate will be approximately unbiased, and um, we'll have approximately the smallest variance of any of any estimators. So that's that's something we we did not talk about, uh, but it's in the book. That's that's a nice property. Um, and then just sort of technically, they're not necessarily unique. I think for the purposes in this class, they almost always will be, um, and they don't necessarily always exist. So. Uh, you can't always use this method, but it is it is very commonly used. Okay, um, I think that brings us to the end of the lecture, uh, and we have about seven minutes left. Um, that I wanted to take some time to answer any other homework questions you guys have. I know, I know some of those later problems are are pretty tricky. Um, so let me quick stop the recording here. And